And you sign one for Steve. Him, uh, yeah, because I, I, you said you might have some more you want me yeah. to sign. I want to get Steve's in the mail soon. How's um, he doing? Not good. So he got word yeah. that he, you know, he had word that he was going to be um, a recipient, you know, potential recipient for a lung transplant. And then he went through all these tests for like four months. And basically, have you, you, it's been a while since you've seen Andrew. Oh, Andrew, how are you? Good. It's been a long while. <laughs> I used to ha how are you doing, Andrew? Good. How about you? Now, are you the biker? I am. Oh, yeah. right. Just a little bit, really. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. So good for you. Shall we get started? Yeah. You bet. All right. Let me introduce you, and then we'll I'll turn it over. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Martha Cole, and I'm a historical specialist at the Montana Historical Society, and it's my great privilege to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Um, George Bristol has had a lifelong interest in Glacier National Park, which began with a summer job uh, in 1961 that he held during his uh, years at college at the University of Texas. After graduation, he pursued a successful career in public relations, frequently returning to Glacier for vacations. His time in the park nourished his uh, interest in photography and poetry. An award-winning photographer and poet, uh, Mr. Bristol received an MFA in writing from Vermont College. He served on the National Park Foundation Board, and in 1999, he co-founded the Glacier Fund, which became the Glacier National Park Conservancy. We're delighted that George Bristol is here with us today uh, for a talk followed by a book signing in the, uh, in the lobby, uh, the subject of which will be that book, Glacier National Park, A Culmination of Giants. Please help me welcome George Bristol. Martha, are you going to let me know when we need to go I over? Okay, thank you. Just try to get a little mechanic down pat here. Uh, th thank you very much for for having me. Uh, I want to introduce some special people before I get started. Uh, all of them have had something to do with this book. My wife Gretchen, who read and reread every chapter more than once and some of them more than twice. Uh, my daughter Jennifer, who typed the first draft of the book, and the second draft, and the third draft, uh, until we finally just had to turn it in to the publisher. And the most interesting person I met in 2013, I have another book, uh, earlier book, on politics and parks. And he was the moderator of the conservation and environmental panel, and my book was on that panel. Uh, and his name is Weir Labatt from San Antonio, Texas. He and one of his friends, who is now the chief editor of the uh, University of Nevada Press, Char Miller, uh, cooked up and started pushing me to write a book on Glacier National Park. I finally, after about a year, a year and a half, decided to do it. I'd gotten over the having to write one book. And uh, one of the things you have to do is turn in six or seven names of people that could be a peer reviewer. Well, I turned in Weir because he's a, probably in Texas one of the two or three leading experts on water and conservation. And lo and behold, they drew his name to be the peer reviewer of my book. And it was such a good review, I brought him along. <laughs> and he and his wife, Laura, are our dear friends. And, uh, so we, we're glad to have, have them with us. And Laura, we put them on a 10 mile hike up to Granite Park Chalet and out. And uh, Laura's resting, as you can, those of you taken that hike before. Uh, let me start with a, a poem that was in my other book and set the predicate for what I'm going to talk about.
It's entitled, In All Likelihood, My Mother Read the August the 5th, 1940 Life Magazine. How else on steaming evenings with me only a week away could she catch Corporal Hitler and the cancerous mole Mussolini as they moved from Compagnie across Libya, all or far removed, nothing undone yet, yet she and perhaps I sensed the tension as her fan and Emerson oscillator rustled the pages of photographs of dictators who, like the Kelvinator, were poised to change our lives. The upright radio reached out, gathering scratchings from blackened skies, Auden's unmentionable odor lingering on the rim of raised gin glasses and the lips of Lucky Strike smokers. The world was a brewing anew, men, material, entire countries, soon wrapped in winter blankets, suffering jungle rot, inhuman, the in, inhaling the inhuman stench of gasoline leaking from reeking meadows. My small world would know none of this, even as a cry went up down the block and neighborhood women hurried their own children inside before they ran in to comfort those who had lost theirs. Yet 56 years later, all that trails behind the beginning of my own history, spotted with later conflicts as I thumbed the near yellowed pages where, when colored photographs of Glacier National Park's Emerald Peaks confirmed that somehow my mother began to steer me toward those safe mountains even as the dread of war ran through the darkness of her womb. This magazine I found in a store and it has the first two color pictures in Life magazine of a national park. And interestingly enough, even though there are other photographs, a lot of them are in black and white, they're both of Glacier National Park. Imprinted on me a week before I was born. Uh, in my book, I, I talk about these these connections, uh, these these overlaps, these forces of nature, God, Nappy, to the Blackfeet, and I'd like to begin today by reading a piece I wrote. Uh, before the book, but then incorporated it into the book, it made some changes to fit it. In an undated trap tract, Freeman Tilden of the National Park Service wrote a piece for the predecessor of the National Park Foundation titled The Fifth Essence. His premise was that after the early Greek philosophers decided there were four elements or essence, fire, air, water, and earth, they began to perceive there was something else, a soul of the elements. Behind the thing seen must lie the greater thing unseen, the fifth essence. Tilden went on to explain that each individual could find that essence in his or her own backyard, but the consummate expression of this ultimate wealth of the human spirit can be found in the national park system. In writing this book, I have thought much about this and have come forth with some thoughts on Tilden's message. It does not matter which park you are considering within the system, from the great western panoramas to the silent sites of the American struggle. Each carries with it a spiritual element of the American story about the places through which our ancestors passed until culminating in those unique triangulations of the present, you and me. So when we start at the, stand at these awesome vistas, next to the silent guns, or yes, at cliff dwellings of people who came long ago and disappeared before modern man set foot on this continent, we are at once looking into the face of the past, the mirror of the present, and an absolute necessity for our future. In doing so, we need to contemplate that greater thing unseen 
and ask ourselves how we can be a part of the first essential in protecting this ultimate wealth of the human spirit. To not do so will ensure that this most original American idea will have a diminished future. In turn, our children and their children will be a diminished people. For the national parks, like all great institutions, require the dedicated commitment of each and every citizen if they are to be more than a distant object without soul or relevant meaning. From the outset, men and women recognized this remarkable responsibility and went about ensuring these places would be saved for visitation, contemplation, and inspiration for future generations. In many instances, they paid for the land out of their own pockets or deeded over to the government land they already owned. Indeed, the early explorers and advocates of Yellowstone, our first national park, band together to preserve and protect the incredible area by ensuring the land went to the government and then championing national park status to protect its wondrous natural gifts rather than buying it up and exploiting it for personal use. That has continued without abatement since 1872. We Americans are a generous people. From church to exploration, from museums to medical research, we find ways to find an extra dollar to donate to worthy causes. That is as it should be. Our form of governance and interdependence requires citizen participation. Our form of governance and <clears throat> at the ballot box and the collection plate are essential. That generosity that often reaches spectacular heights when it comes to our national parks. One family, the Rockefellers, have been instrumental in helping create or preserve many of our national treasures, including the Grand Tetons, Great Smoky Mountains, Acadia, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and the Virgin Island National Parks. Lawrence Rockefeller was the embodiment of that grand tradition, continuing to think and to give us gifts of parks up until his death in 2004. Yet the Rockefellers are but one family among many who have recognized the importance of private philanthropy as a means to initiate and continue the preservation of our most cherished natural and historic possessions. The Mellon family has contributed greatly to the creation of many of our national shorelines. The Roosevelt Memorial Association donated Theodore Roosevelt Island. In California, the Muir Woods was given by Congressman William Kent and his wife. Many foundations, corporations, and individuals contributed to the rehabilitation of the Statue of Liberty and restoration of Ellis Island's Grand Hall. Those generosities are matched yearly by other gifts in every part. Perhaps not all are great in financial terms, but are just as important. Surely a volunteer trail crew worker is every bit as important as gifts of the Rockefellers. For what good are glaciers trails if they are allowed to fall into disrepair and unsightliness? There is room for every citizen to support the parks of his or her choice. In fact, there is a necessity, regardless of whether or not there is an unending flow of generosity from major benefactors or congressional appropriations. Because the first essential of the fifth essence is that every citizen does more than dutifully pay taxes and pray that some small part will support the parks. Just the name alone should be prompting enough, the national parks. They are not just government properties, although I must say the National Park Service is staffed with dedicated people who have done us great service over the years, 101 years to be exact. They are our parks. They are the embodiment of the essential democracy expounded by Teddy Roosevelt. Thus, the ultimate gift of the first essential cannot be measured or sustained by sterile numbers on a balance sheet or the generous support of others. Every citizen must approach them with the thought that those who give in the past did so for the benefit of the present 
and in turn, those who will stand in your place at some future time will be able to sense that behind the things seen, you, through your generosity of self and means, become part of the greater thing unseen, forever present. Now for a moment I want to read you just a little about some of the things I wrote that tied these things together. And let me say, say this before I get, get started. Uh, when I said I hesitated for almost a year and a half, I not only had written a book about politics and parks and a lot about Glacier, but I really wondered to myself whether I had the expertise to write about anything except trail crews, parties, and drinking beer, and visiting with Nina Harrison and Aiden and others, and just enjoying myself. I wasn't an expert on geology or Native Americans or anything, so I had to take a two months in a cabin up with some friends of mine in the park and just think this thing through. And one thing I discovered, there were giants at every step of the way on the foundation and creation of the land that would become known as Glacier, and then the giants among the people who made it so and have kept it so. So I want to read a few passages from Glacier Park, a culmination of giants, all in their own way point to that force or forces, natural or spiritual or both, that played a role in setting the stage for the next participants in the formation and preservation of the lands that would come to be known as Glacier National Park. What was to become the unique mountainous splendor of Glacier National Park in northwestern Montana originally lay beneath a massive shallow sea, the belt sea that formed a, a billion and a half years ago. The sea stretched from what is now the Arctic down through modern day Idaho, Montana, Washington, and British Columbia. Some have speculated the sea covered the Earth's formative crust to a much larger extent, but we have no way of knowing because great masses of the sea migrated to other continents. For purposes of this book, we will consider that which covered what is now much of northwestern America and nearby Canada. It would remain so for 700 million years. Over those 700 million years, the sea was fed by a mix of rivers that created silt Comp comprised of calcium carbonate and quartz, ingredients necessary to completing that phase of this geographic epoch. Accumulated over time, the results were sediments which when fired by volcanoes and compressed to extremity, gave up layers of quartzite, argillite, limestone, and dolomite. At the same time, the sea waxed and waned created coastal waves and prints. Today, those formation and layers are visible throughout Glacier National Park. Where did the rivers originate? Most likely to the west of the sea. But wasn't the west what is now the Pacific Ocean and don't rivers run to the ocean? They do if they happen to be going that way. <laughs> but they weren't. Something beside the Pacific must have been there those 700 million years ago. It is believed that a substantial, substantial landmass was located there with its own east-facing mountains, supplying its runoff rivers with mud, silt, and rock to feed the sea with those essential foundation materials. To add to the foundation, lava flowed to the sea floor about 750 million years ago. This igneous addition can be seen as pillow lava formations in the Granite Park area and as the Purcell Seal in the northeast area of the park. Eventually, rivers, sediment, and magna flow filled the sea, and there it lay, doing absolutely nothing significant except continuing to compact. And perhaps, as one is so inclined to believe, 
to figure out how its next moves would accommodate the rise of humankind, who I might add were not even on the scene anywhere on Earth and wouldn't be for another 600 million years. So maybe it just lay there compressing. During this time, another geological formation was being created, stromalotites, species of blue-green algae formed in the shadow waters of the Baltic Sea. Starting a, hundred, a billion and a half years ago, sunlight induced a reaction that allowed the algae to consume carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen in the process. This transformation would, over millions of years, enrich the oxygen-poor atmosphere. As the Earth's organisms began to breathe in the oxygen, life forms developed until mammals appeared, followed by humans. Again, one can speculate why the natural order took this route instead of another to reach an accommodation for Homo sapiens to, to strive. At some point, a stirring occurred. A slight shifting of a new plate collision ensued, and out of the grate underneath, those ancient super-hardened layers from the long-gone sea broke the surface, thrusting a huge plate up and over the younger formations. The wedge, later be named the Lewis Overthrust in honor of Meriwether Lewis, would expose those long dormant layers that were nearly one billion years older than the newly formed crust. This was not in the natural order. Billion plus year old laters and rock stood on the shoulder of much younger ones. This was not an abrupt event. The wedge heaved itself up and over the younger layers, continuing to compress, seeking its final resting place. Creeping in a northeasterly direction at less than a snail's pace, it arrived at its present location, some 50 miles from the original eruption site. Over millions of years, it marched, coming to a halt in what is nor now northwest Montana. Contained in a section of the Scalossus was the area to be known as Glacier National Park. Even to this day, throughout the park, one can witness on the faces of Glacier Mountainside the first true artistry of the Earth's evolution. The landscaping and the artistry would change again and again before its designation as a park in 1910. For millions of years, even as the wedge continued to shove toward its current location, other forces of wind and water would tear away at its peaks. Then to hasten the leveling of the mountains, something new began to occur, ice. Over the past 2.5 million years, a series of ice ages of varying degrees of intensity and duration occurred as the climate cooled. What caused this is open to speculation. Perhaps the formation of the mountain ranges themselves changed the weather patterns, which cooled temperatures enough to facilitate the creation of key ingredients of glacier, snow. And not just snow at Christmas time, but continuous snow that blanketed and built upon itself for cycles of thousands of years. As it fell, the second ingredients came into play. The temperature level was cold enough to keep the snow from melting. At some point, after all that accumulation and compression, the ice became so weighty that it reformed its bottom layer to a gel-like substance flexible enough to move glaciers down and through mountains by gravitational force. As the mountains and ice were settling into their significant partnership during the Wisconsin glaciation period, nature, perhaps with human help, was making another change. For reasons not yet fully understood, the woolly mammoth began to die off to the point of extinction. The steppe buffalo roamed North America more than a million years ago. Somewhere toward the end of that cycle, it evolved into the great age bison, 
that lived until approximately 30,000 years ago. It was then replaced by two subspecies, bison occidentalis and bison antiquus. These two species, along with mammoths, mastodons, and horses, were now hunted by human arriving humans. By 10,000 to 11,000 years ago, most of the occidentalist species in North America had vanished. But one hardy survivor remained. Bison antiquus stayed around until it evolved into a smaller American bison approximately 5,000 years ago. With the aid of kinder weather, hunting, and plains management practices by what, by what were a small number of Native Americans, and in the absence of the white man, the latter-day bison grew to a population of 60 million, ranging from Canada to Mexico to the East Coast. With the later <coughs> disruption of the Euro-Americans, that, that number shrank to 33,000 by the end of the 19th century. What was taken the natural order millions of years to cultivate and refine was practically decimated in less than 300 years. For the next eight to 9,000 years, as the waves of the original people were spilling onto the bountiful plains, the glaciers of Montana would continue to shape and sculpt. Even in their diminished state, the remaining glaciers today add bits and pieces to the landscape. Unfortunately, their retreating actions may be akin to a cleanup duty before the going out of business sign is posted. In a little over 200 years, after the Earth spent several billion years trying to get it just right, humans have set a frightening new timeline for the disappearance of the water and cooling towers of Glacier National Park, and that is being duplicated all over the world. At the creation of the park in 1910, 150 active, vibrant glaciers, many awe-inspiring in their size, were located in the park. During my time in Glacier in 1961 and 62, there were 80 glaciers. Today, there are 25 or six, and some of those are on life support. The consequences will be catastrophic. The great, greater irony is that on many levels and areas of the park, the great sculptures will survive. The question will be who will remain to wonder at their majesty. Perhaps they will still simply stand there in silence, awaiting nature to recalibrate, which should take a very long period of time. As Christopher White put it in his brilliant book, The Melting World, when climate and ice have been in equilibrium, civilization has flourished. Who may not want, we, one may not want to witness the reverse side of his observation. Excuse me just a minute. Between the dry air and the smoke. But in a sense, I'm not complaining because I'm from Texas where it's about 105 degrees right now. The exactness of the when and where and how and who is forever lost in the mist and mystery of time unrecorded. Yet we know with some certainty that early humans may have migrated from Asia through perhaps different routes in different times. Several possibilities literally opened as the ice sheets encrusting most of North America drifted apart in, into pathways. The melting withdrawal of the ice sheet created two likely avenues, one the Pacific coastline and the other down through Canada from Alaska, extending in a southeasterly direction toward what was now the Great Lakes. It is the movement of these tribes and bands I will concentrate on due to the impact, their impact thousands of years later on Glacier Park. As they moved, the original people also began to formulate their 
idea of what embraced the significance of their natural surroundings and supernatural surroundings. The tribes <coughs> created their own religion and their own god, Nappy, the old man. Nappy to the Blackfeet, and interestingly enough to other tribes as well, was the maker of the earth, man and woman, and all the wild things. What is most interesting in the sequencing of his work. According to Nappy lore, in the beginning the world was covered by water. Nappy, who appears to have pre-existed the water, decided to explore what lay beneath and sent Muskrat to find the answer. Muskrat returned with a small ball of mud. He, Nappy blew on the ball of mud and continued to blow until it became the whole earth. Then he made mountains, rivers, valleys, plains, animals, and finally a wife for himself. Nappy and his wife would jointly go on to make humans and implant in them standards for living and methods for surviving. At some point, he must have explained in some fashion that it was good. Then he climbed into a mountain and disappeared. If this truth among the original people of North America and Canada parallels the fact shaping of the land that would become the park and its surrounding geography and geology, then we have ample food for thought. And if areas of the tale seem to be biblical, then perhaps there's room for science and, exist and religion to exist in some complementing factor. Whatever the intervening history of Nappy's people, the comings, the goings, the forming of a great empire of the plains, the arrival of white explorers, then the flood of settlers, the diminishing of great sustaining bison herds that were all but gone by the 1870s and 80s, starvation, smallpox, and finally retreat to reservations, the tribe held firm to Nappy's teachings. This was best pointed out by Walter McClintock in the Old North Trail written in 1910. The Blackfeet were firmly, firm believers in the supernatural and in the control of human affairs by good and evil powers of the invisible world. The great spirit or great mystery of good power is everywhere and everything. Mountains, plains, winds, water, trees, birds, and animals. All animals receive their endowment of power from the sun, differing in some degree, but the same kind that, that received by man and all things animal and inanimate. Some birds and animals, such as grizzly bear, buffalo, beaver, wolf, eagles, and raven, are worshipped because they possess a larger amount of the good perfect than others. And so, when a Blackfoot is in trouble or peril, he naturally plays praise to them for assistance. The good perfect. And this is the race of original Americans that the white man and the black robes were determined to Christianize and civilize. The greatest incivility lay with the congressional perpetrators and the exploiters that followed. The result of these actions after the fact would continue to create ill will among the tribes in conflict that lasts to this day. Whatever the final determination through the courts or negotiation, if there can be such a finality, the tribes possess a constance for which they can take pride. It is something all of us should honor and try to emulate. The original people left only footprints over thousands of years and few of those on the landscape that would become known as Glacier Park. That is not to say they did not camp, hunt, and fish among the valleys and mountains, or they did not find and use passes and trail to find secret grounds where they held religious ceremonies, and yes, even do battle with the competing tribes in the West. Because all things, mammals through fish, earth, and rocks, have meaning, life, and place. They tread lightly on the land for centuries. Most giants are applauded for doing something, but there is an equally strong case to be made 
that not doing something, destroying the land, is just as meritorious. The problem is that these giants are difficult to discover, so that when they are discovered, they are due recognition and honor. And even if left undiscovered, they are giants nonetheless. Even before his first visit to Glacier Park in 1915, before there was a National Park Service, he would meet with leaders of the Blackfeet tribe to hear their complaints about the lack of Indian names for glaciers, mountains, and rivers, and lakes. With a sensitivity befitting the occasion and in good humor, he agreed that changes were necessary. Lake McDermott in the Many Glacier Valley became Swift Current Lake. Others would be changed or added over time. On his first inspection trip as assistant to the Secretary of Interior, he became convinced that the roads or lack of roads in Glacier and other parks were terrible and needed to be addressed to meet the rising American love affair with the automobile. He also saw that Glacier required a new headquarters, bought the necessary land out of his own pocket and gave it to the park. He would do that time after time both with personnel and with property. When necessary, which in the former, formative years of the Park Service, he would take on the high and the mighty to establish firm ju ju juris jurisdiction of the agency so that parks could be, would not be whipsawed by politics, power, or profit. That firmness of purpose would include confronting United States Senator Thomas Walsh of Montana over sheep grazing rights in Glacier National Park after World War I. For the same reason, he would take on Louis Hill and the Great Northern Railroad. After 10 years of delay and several renewals, the final extension for the destruction and removal of the sawmill used to build Many Glacier Hotel was set to expire. The permit had been given with the understanding that as soon as the hotel was completed, the sawmill would be removed and the site restored to a natural state. But the sawmill remained. Great Northern asked for another extension, which he granted. And then when the day came and went, instead of reaching in his pocket to pay for the removal, he reached for a match and blew up the mill with dynamite he personally had packed. But in August of 1924, he would make the decision that forever change the face and accessibility of Glacier Park. He approved a road that would not only link east and west side of the park, would boot, but do so in a way that would lay easy on the landscape and the eyes. Stephen Tying Mather was old New England establishment by birthright, even though he grew up in California. He graduated from the University of California at Berkeley in 1887. He moved east and went to work as a reporter for the New York Sun, where he honed his essential stock and trade, public relations and media promotion. It would serve him well both in his business and national park phase of his life. In short order, Mather, with the help of his new assistant, Horace Albright would lay out an ambitious set of goals for their agreed upon one year stay in service to keep Albright in Washington rather than returning to California to practice law and marry his fiance, Mather authored him another thousand dollars out of his own pocket, a practice he would continue until the Congress of the United States forbid him to do so. Mather's one-road philosophy of high construction standards coupled with lying lightly on the land would lead to what was to become the Going to the Sun Road dedicated in July 1933 and completed in 1934. And then, by then, Mather's ill health would catch up with him, and after a series of strokes, he died on January the 22nd, 1930. At the dedication of the official opening of the Glowing to the Sun Road, a memorial plaque was unveiled in Mather's honor for his, not only his role in making the road highly lay lightly, 
but for his con contribution to all national parks. The plaque read, and by the way, this was the first plaque of many around the country. He laid the foundation for the national park system, defining and establishing the policies on which its areas should be developed and conserved, unimpaired for future generations. There will never be an end to the good he has done. As Albright observed, on Mather's first trip to Glacier Park in 1915, it seemed impossible that every new national park appeared more spectacular than the last. I remember that Mather joined me. Neither of us spoke for some time. Then I heard him say, Horace, what God-given opportunity has come our way to preserve wonders like these before us. We must never forget to, uh, or abandon our gift. Unfortunately, I only had time to put several examples out of the book. There, there will be others that you'll see as you read the book. I may have missed some, but I've tried to be as inclusive as I possibly could because I began to see that all these events and people, rocks, ice, John Muir, George Bird Grinnell, James J. Hill, Louis Hill, Stephen Mather, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, and others were all connected and worked toward a common goal of creating a national park in northwestern Montana. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Do a couple questions.